Yeah, I think already two past the two thirty here. Okay. Yeah, we have three hour difference. Uh, yeah. Still good morning for you. <laughs> yeah. So That's I think it's time to, to get it started. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Douglas Cook to give a virtual seminar today. Uh, in case you, some of you don't know me, I'm Jian Ma, a solving geneticist in agronomy department here at Purdue. So Dr. Cook is currently a professor in the Department of Plant Pathology at UC Davis. He received his PhD degree in bacterial genetics from the University of Wisconsin Medicine, and then conducted postdoc research at the Johns Hopkins University. He then served on the faculty of Texas a and M University from 1992 to 2000, and then he joined UC Davis, and I think still there until now. Uh, Dr. Cook is an internationally recognized leader in the field of legume biology. And uh, back to early 1990s, his lab pioneered the use of Medicago truncatula as a model plant for uh, basic study, particularly study of legume biology. Using this model system, his lab has made tremendous fundamental discoveries in the field of both pathogenic and beneficial plant microbe interactions. In addition to basic research, Dr. Cook has made great efforts on translating basic discoveries into legume crop improvement and gene plasm enhancement, particularly uh, in the developing world. Today, Dr. Cook is going to talk about domestication impacts on plant microbe symbiosis. So let's welcome Dr. Cook for the seminar. Thank you. Thank oh, you. The, yeah, the screen is yours. Okay. So uh, I have minimized uh, my view of, of the audience, but if you know people have questions, um, you can either maybe submit a chat and, and maybe Jin Chen can um, let me know if, if something arises. You're also welcome to just unmute yourself and ask a question that I won't consider uh, to be interrupting you if you have a burning question. So uh, Jin Shen's introduced the title. I'm gonna talk about um, uh, the possibility that domestication human activities have impacted uh, microbial symbioses. And, and by this, I mean the microbes that plants associate with. I don't mean symbioses in the sense of mutualisms necessarily, but all plant microbe interactions. And they ask if if um, if domestication has impacted uh, uh, the, uh, these kind of associations. I'm going to give you the take home message uh, before I give you the seminar. And here's the take home message: microbes that crops co-evolved with that their that their wild ancestors co-evolved with are not the microbes in globally dispersed agricultural systems. There's limited relationship, and this has potentially important implications. And I say potentially because discerning function of complex microbial communities remains um, more of an aspiration uh, than, uh, than a, a real tangible uh, outcome. But I wanna suggest that there are a couple of possibilities and I'll show you some data that, are, that support this. One possibility is that optimized function, microbes, a plant and a microbe that really work well together, is likely to be locally specific. By locally specific, I, might, I mean even a local population or local agronomic situation. And, it's, and, I'll, and I'll show you data that shows that optimized function occurs in natural systems. And I suspect it might be, if not a unique property of natural system, then it's much more prevalent in natural systems than it is in, in cultivated systems. And the reason I, I, and there could be many factors, geography, soil, plant genotype, local environment, agronomic practices that dictate these differences. But to the extent that these differences exist, um, you know, then one, I think, if, if you were me at least, I tend to be a skeptic about things. Um, question, uh, a lot of the efforts in the plant microbiome, particularly ones that attempt to apply uh, microbes in agricultural systems, uh, not to question whether uh, functional traits might occur, but whether those traits are uh, 
uh, our natural co-evolved um, traits or, or something different. Anyway, uh, these are things we can discuss maybe towards the end of the talk. Um, my lab for the last, oh gosh, decade or so has been interested in the impact of domestication. And we began this by looking at the effects on the crop. And in this case, our crop is uh, chickpea, Cicer eritinum. And there are two wild progenitors. And if you wanna understand domestication, you have to understand, in my opinion, the, the starting point from which domestication occurred. That is, you need to understand diversity in the wild situation before one can assert that any kind of change has happened in the cultivated system. And, and, and the extent to which these wild progenitors are characterized in most plant domestication stories varies a lot. Uh, here, we started explicitly with the wild species. And we're interested in shifts in genetic diversity, shifts in trait diversity at the level of phenotypes that might've occurred um, during domestication. And one of the things that I'll show you some data for initially is loss of plant genetic and trait variation, which is common, I think, to almost all domesticated systems. That's not very, uh, very surprising, but it'll be important in terms of setting things up. The kinds of questions that we have with respect to microbes are what's the origin of microbial diversity? What's that st what's the structure of diversity? Can we, can we identify functional consequences of microbial diversity, particularly in non long-standing natural habitats where plants and microbes have co-evolved together over many, many, many millennia? So once you understand that, one can ask the question, what's the impact of domestication on symbiosis? Because we understand the starting point. And, and one might want to ask, and again, this is aspirational largely, can we improve the crop, in this case, chickpea, by harnessing traits from wild plants and wild microbes? So these are three broad kind of uh, topics that, that we're interested in. Our laboratory, as I'll refer to it, is global, and it's the, it, it is our laboratory uh, is defined by the distribution of chickpea, uh, in its natural systems and, uh, and the crop uh, in the agricultural systems. Now, both the chickpea crop and its microbes originated in Mesopotamia, where they were domesticated about 10 to 12,000 years ago. Mesopotamia, um, literally meaning between the rivers, it's between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, southeastern corner of Turkey. Um, and in that region, while we had domestication that occurred about 10 to 12,000 years ago, there were speciation events that happened in the wild progenitor uh, species that, that date back to about 100,000 years ago. So there's a pretty long um, uh, period of, of evolution that occurred in Turkey. And then over the last several thousand years, with the dates being subject to debate, by the way, um, the crop was moved to India, to Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly Eastern Africa and Ethiopia, to North Africa, um, we have, I have highlighted here Morocco, but in fact, it's grown throughout North Africa and even into Spain. And then much more recently, within the last century or so, the crop was introduced into other parts of the world, particularly North America, Mexico, uh, and Australia. So we have these uh, broad, uh, both geographic and temporal, uh, spatial and temporal scales over which the crop um, has been uh, domesticated and selected. But our story, because I've made the argument that we need to understand the status of the wilds before we can think about understanding the impacts of domestication, our story begins in southeastern Turkey, just uh, north of the of the Syrian border with Syria, where there's a desert, and extending up into a, a mountain range known as the Taurus Minor Mountains, which which are a natural barrier um, that delimits the the range of the wild progenitors of chickpea and. It's about a 100,000 square kilometer area that we explored and that defines the primary known geographic distribution of these wild progenitor species. We literally hopped in a car and drove around and around that part of Southeastern Turkey looking for the progenitors of Cicer eritinum, namely Cicer reticulatum and Cicer echinospermum. And reticulatum and eritinum, the cultivated species separated at the time of domestication about 10,000 years ago. And a kind of sperm the closest sister species, uh, it also occurs in this area, separated about 110,000 years ago. So those are the, the time frames and the species that we were looking for uh, driving around in our cars over multiple years. But every time we every time we found a local instance of a wild species, we wanted to know whether that was a distinct population of the wild species, 
and to collect information on the ecological context that would be important later on. So to do that, this shows a, a, a wild site that's right next to an agricultural field in this particular case. To do that, we would go in and we took surveyor tags. These are not flowers, they're surveyor tags from the data says hardware. We'd mark every plant in the, in the location that we could find. And well, then we would collect, um, this was collected in early May at the time the plants were still vegetated. We would collect tissue and we'd extract DNA. So we'd extract DNA in some cases for up to 100 individuals at each site. We'd take a GPS coordinate so we could discern the specific location and the distance of an individual and its location relative to other individuals. It might be important in trying to understand um, the genetic diversity within a site. And we did this across all sites. It gives us the capacity to, to, to describe a local variance, in this case in, in host genetics, and as well as to determine whether different, re different areas are differentiated genetically from one another. In other words, do we have different populations? The other thing that we did is uh, at each site and at 10 locations within a site, we collected soil cores. We took five soil cores from beneath a, plant, a place where a plant was growing. These are microsites that the plant has identified uh, as being ecologically suitable. And then we took five soil cores away from um, uh, the wild progenitor plants. So these are, uh, and, and we took that soil data several hundred different samples across all sites. And we ran a number of different analyses, including ICPMS and other kinds of analyses to look um, at both the organic and inorganic constituents of the soil. We were characterizing soil. And not surprising what we found uh, was that within a site, um, soil types were largely homogeneous, but they differed between sites. And that's shown up here on the left. I, I mention this because it's going to become important in a minute. Sites have distinct to different degrees uh, soil types. The other thing we did is we, we sampled uh, local environment, in this case by planting uh, small microcenters in the soil that could record temperature and humidity um, over uh, over our long intervals throughout the year. I'm, I'm not going to, that data is not important here, so I won't describe it any further, but we did collect information about the explicit environment. And the other thing we did that's quite, that become quite important, in addition to collecting plant DNA, we collected microbes. So in addition to the, the soil cores for chemical analysis, we collected a separate set of soil cores for microbial diversity. And within those soil cores, we sampled seven, eight compartments. Um, seven of those compartments are um, uh, non-living compartments. They were just as DNA. Microbes from leaves are their DNA, from the surface of roots, from the soil in the core, but not touching the root, from inside the root from the surface of the nodule, from inside the nodule, and so on. And we did this at uh, five uh, live plant uh, samples within each site and five samples that did not contain the progenitors of chickpeas. So we had, I think, about 820 or so um, microbial samples. We also collected living organisms from the nodules as well as from different uh, root compartments. So we put together a library of living organisms and eventually also whole genome sequences for hundreds of strains. So we generated a massive amount of data on microbes. And the plant part of the story, by the way, in, in the ecology is published uh, a few years ago in Nature Communications, if you're interested. The first author is Von Wettberg et al. Um, I'm going to describe the plant data at a very simple level, but it's, it becomes important to the microbial work. So we sequenced um, both whole genome as well as reduced representation genomes. And the reduced, reduced representation we used a method known as RAD uh, genotyping by sequencing. We sequenced about a, a thousand genomes from the first year of collection. And with that data, uh, one can um, use um, genetic analyses based on allele frequencies to divide those hundred, hundred those thousand genomes into genetic populations. And, and we could immediately uh, with that RAD GBS data, distinguish the two species, Cicer echinospermum and Cicer reticulatum. And we can divide each of those species into genetic populations in, uh, in, uh, in the genetic sense that is based on allele frequencies. Now, one of the, the sort of first important observation is those genetic populations, which again are depicted here in, that, in this lower bar here. Each color represents a different population, and there are a series of vertical lines that represent individuals. So, all the plants at Sariakaya at Chernak on the far right hand side here, for example, are genetically very, very similar. They all have this purple bar and they all come from one location. And that turns out to be a main um, 
sort of effect genetically. That is, um, individual sites locally tend to have single local populations. Different sites, even when they're near one another, often have different genetic populations. In some cases, different sites share uh, uh, a common metapopulation uh, in common. And so this sort of describes the population genetics of the material. The other thing um, that's important, excuse me, in this that'll become later is that all the names in blue here are Cicero reticulatum. And these are from sort of high elevation uh, limestone soils. And everything in red here is the other species, Cicero canis permum. And this is from a, a lower elevation uh, volcanic plateau that has a different soil type. So we have two different location types. They, they distinguish, they're distinguished by soil as well as by, by elevation. And they define the habitats of the two species, Cicero reticulatum and Cicero canis permum. And so the soil type data, if we bring it back in, everything here uh, in that this lower right-hand side uh, in these light gray triangles, these are all the volcanic soils that are associated with Cicero canis permum, quite distinct in terms of their composition from all of the reticulatum cells, but the reticulatum cells uh, are also, also differentiate by sites. And this issue of soil type diversity will, come in, will become important and um, uh, sort of uh, giving away part of the story, it's well understood that um, soil composition can be an important factor in determining microbial communities. So we have variation in, in, in the local ecology and the population genetics of, of the host, soil type differences and so on. We sequence about 300, uh, in addition to those 1,100 uh, reduced representation genomes, 300 full genomes. And um, there's a lot of different stuff you can do with this kind of data, that, but the sort of high level summary is that if you look in the wild relatives, you find about 7 million variants, single nucleotide polymorphisms, small insertion deletions that are segregating in the wild material. But only about 170,000 of those are segregating in the cultivated material. That is, there's a huge loss in, in, in simple genetic diversity um, uh, through domestication and breeding. And in fact, it turns out this breaks into sort of two stepwise um, changes. There's a difference between wild species and land races, about a tenfold change in diversity. And the land races, in this case, were material collected by uh, Nikolai Vavilov about 100 years ago. We sequenced, oh, uh, I don't remember, a few hundred of his, uh, of his material. And then if you sequence modern elites that breeders are working with around the world, there's a, then a, another roughly tenfold decrease in diversity. So that, not quite a hundredfold change associated with two steps. While the land races over a couple, over several millennia and land races to elites over the last century or so. So, and, uh, and so we see this massive uh, decrease in plant uh, genetic diversity. This is the situation with, with the plants. But what about the microbes? Now, our, our study system has the same shape uh, geographically for the microbes as it did for the plants. We're interested in at the point of origin, which is where I'm going to spare a kind of fair amount of time talking. But also, what happened to the microbes as the crop spread? You think, did the microbes follow the crop? Did the crop have to pick up new microbes? Um, and depending on those scenarios, did, does it make a difference at the level of function? Now, if you think about the chickpea root, given the chickpeas a, a legume, of course, uh, nodules uh, that fix nitrogen on the roots of the legume plants are important, but also there'll be many other microbes on the leaves, in the leaves, on the roots, in the roots, in the soil nearby that's been conditioned by plant uh, secretions, plant metabolites. And so we're interested in the structure of those microbial communities. And you can imagine that those communities could be quite complex. But I'm gonna start with a simple uh, example uh, where uh, the plant trait, namely nitrogen fixation, is determined by a single microbe within the genus Mesorhizobium. So Cicer species, particularly the three we're talking about, domesticated in the two wilds, associate, as it turns out, exclusively with the genus Mesorhizobium. And with Mesorhizobium, they fix nitrogen. Uh, and this is important. And, and if you're interested in this, this was published a couple of years ago by uh, with the first author being a graduate student in the lab. So the, the, the situation at the center of origin, um, we know, about the crops that I've just told you about, the plants, Cicero reticulatum in blue is in these high elevation limestone uh, uh, locations and Cicero kind of in these lower elevation basaltic volcanic derived uh, locations. 
And it turns out there are two distinct types of microbes that, that characterize these two systems. Cysorchinospermum exclusively associates in the wild with Mesorhizobium cysori, where Cysorreticulatum in the wild exclusively associates with two different uh, wild microbes that are related to one another, Mesorhizobium metatraneum and Mesorhizobium temporatum. So there's a relatively simple microbial diversity in the wild um, systems at the level of species, and they have pretty much a one-to-one -one association with, with the plants. But keep in mind that those plants also differ. Each, each location where we find the microbes differs not only in the plant species that's present, but also in the soil types uh, that are present. Now, the situation is we started to move globally and we sampled, well, uh, well almost 2,000 different um, nodules uh, globally. We sequenced about 1,200 high quality genomes from that set. When we went into Ethiopia and we, we collected and, and uh, sequenced uh, about 300 uh, different microbes, we found a very different situation than we found in Turkey. First of all, we found very high diversity, 10 new species of Mesorhizobium, always Mesorhizobium associated with chickpea, but 10 species that were not found at the center of origin. And rarely did we find anything that even looked like the microbe from the center of origin, other than the fact that it was in the same genus. So in, in Ethiopian agriculture on chickpea, the symbionts are dominated by non-native symbionts. In fact, I think one could argue that non-native symbionts are simply not present. There's limited structuring by geography, which is quite different than we found in, in Turkey and high diversity. So a uh, very different situation than we found in the wilds. So again, here's the wild, three different species uh, on two different uh, plant hosts. And they move globally. Every time we went into a new country, uh, we found new diversity and new species. And uh, in that publication that I mentioned, we had reported 28 different species of, of microbes present, um, uh, uh, present around the world, all in the genus Mesorhizobium, fixing nitrogen with chickpea. But it turns out that number keeps going up as we sample uh, more countries and more situations. So I don't know what the upper limit will be. It will be quite high. We can depict this diversity in a number of different ways, but from the whole genome data, we in this particular um, uh, uh, phylogram at the top, we used 400 uh, genes that are common to uh, bacterial species, and we uh, built a phylogenetic tree using a tool called Phylogram. It just depicts the relationships of these different microbes and provides the context for understanding the diversity of the microbes relative to their geographic origins and so on. We can use a tool uh, called uh, an approach um, called average nucleotide identity, which simply looks at the nucleotide distance between any two strains and is now the basis, primary basis of bacterial taxonomy. So we can use, we use this average nucleotide identity uh, of 95% or greater to decide when we have a new species. And so 28 new species in the missional analysis, 20 of which are novel. So a uh, huge diversity. Every time you sample new locations, you found new microbes, very different than the center of origin. Interestingly, we built that other phylogenetic tree that I mentioned based on genes, 400 conserved genes. But it turns out if you, after you've sequenced the genomes and you annotate the genomes for which genes are present, and you, you find that in a comparison of any two strains, they don't have the same genes. Some genes are in common, some genes are different. We can think about this as presence-absence variation. And if you take a, make a presence-absence variation, gene, gene presence-absence across the matrix of strains, you can assemble a phylogenetic tree based on presence absence, not a standard phylogenetic criteria. You get exactly the same uh, trees of species within species and among species. So presence absence variation, whether a gene is present or not, is not only uh, abundant within this material, it reflects the evolutionary history of the material. And this is important. Um, it is, um, we, can, we can think about uh, something known as the pan genome. And, if, if you take any individual genome amongst this set, you find about 6,500 genes per genome of the microbe. But if you compare the genes present between the different uh, microbial strains, and these are using, by the way, completely closed and finished pack biogenomes. So there's no error here due to gene present, due, due to uh, sequencing or limited error due to gene sequencing. So 6,500 genes in the average genome, about 1,200 genes shared in in common amongst the set, and about 42,000 genes that are present 
throughout the whole set. That is 1,200 genes that are strictly conserved, and then a much larger number of genes that are varying among the strains. And this is, turns out to be common to essentially all bacterial species, at least all that I'm aware of. A massive uh, variation in gene content. And um, we looked at this, uh, uh, the numbers above that say 42,000 genes in the pangenome are from the entire genus. But in fact, the exact same picture emerges within in the individual 28 individual bacterial species. And the lower left-hand corner shows something called a pangenome accumulation plot. And I won't go into the details of it, except to say that this issue of high pangenome variation exists at all phylogenetic levels in the data set. These organisms are massively diverse. And whether two strains have genes in common or not, if you just focus on the part of the genome that's variable, you'll find that the extent of the genes they share in common is correlated with two factors. One is the nucleotide distance between the strains under comparison, how similar they are. And the interpretation is here that nucleotide similarity um, sort of provides a rheostat for uh, recombination. And the other thing that um, is correlated with similarity is geographic distance. So the closer you are geographically and the more similar you are at the nucleotide level, the higher um, fraction of, of uh, genes you share in common. Maybe not very surprising. And this might lead you to think that then local populations of the microbe tend to be quite similar in terms of their pan genome, but that would be a mistake to think. And here's uh, uh, an example of this, which turns out to be true at every site where we sampled enough genomes um, to, make, to make the calculation. This is one site in India at Ikrasat uh, in, in Hyderabad. And in this case, we collected 32 different microbial genomes. Um, we purified uh, the organisms and we sequenced their genomes. Now, all of these microbes came from chickpea in a single field in a single year. So they are the microbes selected from that soil by the chickpea crop. And it turns out these 32 different genomes are all in the same species, a species unique to that location in India. And if we take any one of those 32 genomes, we find uh, they have um, in the high 7,000s numbers of genes per genome. But if we make comparisons between those 32 genomes, we find that the number of genes common to all 32 genomes is only about 4,000. The number of genes, and that's so that's the core genome at this site in India, and the number of genes that vary amongst the set is about three times that many, uh, approaching 14,000. So even within local sites in a single year, the microbes selected by a single crop, we find a coherent single species of microbes with a massively diverse uh, pan genome. So this if you work with microbes, this isn't surprising to you. If you don't work, work with microbes, I want you to be thinking, wow, that's massive variation. What does it mean to be a bacterial species? Uh, and what's the, what are the functional consequences of this diversity? If half your genes or so uh, aren't common amongst the species in a geographically local collection, particularly for the trait of nitrogen fixation. I'll come back to that in a minute. So what I've told you is the genomes of these things are massively diverse, even within um, um, geographically local situations. But that's true only for 90% of the genome. It turns out 10% of the genome of all of those organisms across mesorhizobia for the chickpea symbionts, 10% of the genome is hypodiverse, very low diversity. And it turns out um, this is about 500,000 base pairs of the genome. And this is a plot of nucleotide distance between two strains in the wild. Mesorhizobium sicer and Mesorhizobium mediterranean that would hold for any of the strains uh, in the comparison. There's a region of about 500,000 base pairs that's very, very similar to nucleotide level. And it's divided into two regions, kind of like dumbbells of low similarity, separated by a region that's not recognizably similar. And the region between them is full of, uh, full of uh, mobile DNA elements. So this is a hypodiverse region. And that hypodiverse region carries the instructions for being a symbiont of chickpea. There's the genes for nod factor biosynthesis, the genes for, for um, uh, uh, nitrogenase production, genes for type 3 secretion, genes for conjugative transfer, genes for corn sensing, and so on. Um, these are the instructions for how to be a chickpea symbol. They're the kind of the secret agent suitcase. If you were a genus of mesorhizobium and you found that suitcase, and you would have the instructions for how to be a chickpea symbol. So we have this hypodiverse island 
um, relative to diversity elsewhere uh, in the genome. And that hypodiverse island um, is surprisingly, and in a, in, in almost paradoxically, it's hyperdynamic. So very low diversity at the nucleotide level, but it turns out to be extremely dynamic in its presence absence variation between strains. Two things that don't, wouldn't obviously go together until you made the observation and had to try to understand it. So how do we know that, that this region that we call the semi-island, by the way, and that is moved horizontally between, gene, between the different genomes. I'll provide the data for that in a minute. How do we know that that region is hyperdynamic while it's also low in diversity? So what we did was we looked at something called phylogenetic coherence, which is a, a typical measure of horizontal gene transfer. We, took, we, we focused on 14 genomes that, had, that encompassed the diversity of, the, of our mesorhizobium collection that we had sequenced with PAC bio. So we didn't have um, uh, vagaries of, of incomplete assemblies. We took 400 conserved genes from the core gene outside of the symbiosis, the symbiosis island. And then we took 201 genes from the symbiosis island. And for each of those genes, we built individual maximum likelihood trees. So we looked at their evolutionary history amongst those 14 strains. And then we took that full set of genes, 400 for the core genome, 201 for the sim genome, and we concatenated them and we built uh, another phylogenetic tree. And we looked at the coherence between the individual gene trees in the core genome or in the symbiosis island and their respective concatenated gene set to ask if they were coherent. The classical interpretation is if, they're, if the single gene trees agrees with, agrees with the catenated set, then they all have the same history and horizontal gene transfer is not a major factor. But if they're not coherent, then uh, the most likely explanation is gene movement by horizontal gene transfer. So if we, we, can, we can quantify this using a metric called a normalized Robinson folds distance in which values that approach one are high incoherence, horizontal gene transfer being a major factor. And as they approach zero, uh, there's high coherence. They have similar histories. And what you find is that the core genome, the background genome of these strains has relatively high conservation, that is low evidence of genetic exchange Whereas the semi, that's at very similar at the nucleotide level, conversely or paradoxically, has this very low phylogenetic coherence. They don't agree with each other, the genes in the semi, even though they're very similar across the semi at the nucleotide level. So it suggests the semi somehow is hyperdynamic uh, in terms of horizontal gene transfer. And in fact, to look at this spatially within the semi, this is a uh, horizontally here across this slide um, are all the 201 genes in the semi. And we took those 201 genes and, and we took 10 gene sliding windows and built phylogenetic trees. And we looked at Robinson folds of all the adjacent, of, of all the pairs of 10 gene sliding windows. And if you do that, you find very high levels of coherence. Take this cluster here in the middle of genes that are near one another. But these, and this would be a cluster of genes that are staying together evolutionarily, but this cluster right next to them, they're, they're not staying together with. In other words, the genome within the sim island, there appears to be segments of high versus low phylogenetic coherence, which one can interpret as dynamic um, horizontal gene transfer of blocks of genes, not individual genes. And if you take and just plot down, plot down the annotations of the genes in the sim island without uh, reference to where things had high and low uh, coherence, you find that, that to a large extent, these regions of uh, highly conserved phylogenetics um, reflect function. And so the notion here is there's microscale recombination within, the, within this island, within this semi-island. And it's based on horizontal gene transfer between the strains, which makes the symbiotic island paradoxically diverse in terms of gene content, uh, although it is uh, genomically very similar in terms of nucleotide diversity. So this is a remarkably dynamic region of the genome. And it's the region that controls nitrogen fixation, a trait that it must be so important to the plant. How could, how could this be? What are the implications? So domestication of the symbiote. I told you about domestication of the host in the first few slides. So now we can say something about domestication of the symbiote. It's a story of horizontal gene transfer. We started off with three species at the center of origin. And that evolved into at least 28 species globally. And it happened through horizontal gene transfer. The symbiotic island 
um, this 10% this of the genome was part of an integrative conjugative element, a well-established feature of horizontal gene transfer to move, move large blocks of genomes. Um, it's spreading around. And then subsequently, that island continues to be hyperdynamic based on horizontal gene transfer. So I can summarize what we know about mesorhizobium globally and what we know about chickpea in domesticated systems. And say at a very high level, they have opposite trajectories. The crop and its wild progenitors during domestication went from a situation of high diversity to a situation of low diversity, uh, about a 40-fold change in diversity. The microbe, in this case, mesorhizobium, did exactly the opposite. It went from three species at the center of origin to well over 28 species. Now we're well into the 30s and counting, found globally. So these two important uh, my, uh, associates, the plant and its microbe, are going in opposite directions in terms of diversity over the period of domestication and breeding. I don't know uh, what it means, but it's an important question. Um, so in fact, I, I, I wanna come and look at this question about what does it mean? Because we're starting to approach it, but only in a stepwise manner. So the initial question is, what's the relevance of this diversity amongst these symbiotic uh, microbes? Does it make a difference? Now, I think if you're an agriculturalist, you rephrase this question and ask, what's the agronomic relevance? It's a difficult question. <laughs> I can tell you something about the relevance of, of this diversity in the wild systems, and I want to start there. So, and as a reminder, I want to remind you what we knew about the wild systems. They're basically two locations uh, uh, for uh, ecological locations for the wild plant species. These limestone soils that are the, in these high elevation regions that are the home of Cicer reticulatum, and these lower elevation basaltic ge ge um, uh, volcanic soils that are the home of Cicer repentispermum. And when we sequence the microbes that are present, we found that there's a distinct set of microbes in the basaltic soils with repentispermum, and another distinct set of microbes in the limestone soils in association with reticulatum. The question is, do these distributions make ha have any uh, consequences in terms of function? So we did an experiment where we took the microbes of Echinospermum and we put them onto reticulatum as well as onto Echinospermum. We took the microbes from, from, from Echinospermum. We did, we did transplants, the Echinospermum microbes onto reticulatum and the reticulatum microbes onto Echinospermum. But instead of doing them in their um, natural locations, which would have been exceedingly difficult and, and complicated, um, what we did is um, we uh, collected soil from those uh, uh, wild systems and we brought them, um, sorry, we, we collected the microbes and we tested them in a greenhouse. And to do that, we took eight different uh, plants that represented the eight different populations that we knew of in Cicer reticulatum, the plant. The two different two primary populations of Cicer echinus the plant and initially a couple of different examples of cultivated. Now we've expanded this substantially. So we have um, 10 different uh, or 12 different uh, plant genotypes inoculated with two different microbial species, three examples of Mesorhizobium mediterranean, the cognate symbiont of Cicer reticulatum, and three examples of Mesorhizobium cicerum, the, the cognate symbiont of, of Cicer echinospermum. And while these microbes are members of single species, they are themselves quite diverse relative to one another. So diversity is high, both within and among microbial species and within and among the plant species. And in the reciprocal uh, inoculations, we had both homologous interactions where echinospermum receives its native symbionts and where echinus reticulatum receives its native symbionts and heterologous situations where each of those plant genotypes received their non-native organisms. And of course, for, for the cultivated plant, you know, whether you would want to think about native and non-native symbionts is another issue. This is basically an ecological test for local adaptations. Do the wild plants do better when they get their homologous co-evolved organisms, or do they not kill? To ask this question, we set it up in a greenhouse. This was a highly replicated experiment with tenfold replication among um, each plant, plant genotype, microbial genotype combination. We inoculated them with different microbes, six different strains, and then we had controls of no nitrogen, low nitrogen, high nitrogen. Um, we collected data at a lot of different levels. It turns out that plant biomass accumulation uh, turns out to be the, the simplest thing to assay, but also the most indicative of symbiotic performance. And we also looked at, um, at, at the status of microbial development using um, 
multispectral imaging where we could get real detailed information about the structure uh, and number of nodules. But if you take all that data and put it together, you can, in, this, in the case of Cicerocinus firma down here in the lower left-hand corner, um, and looking at biomass bio accumulation as the monitor, see a huge difference in the, in the amount of biomass that's accumulated, the efficiency of symbiosis when a kind of sperm is giving its native symbiont in orange here, as the one it's giving the herologous organism, Cicero reticulatum symbiont. So big differences. So there's lots of signal here. And if you look at the data set at a, at a high level, um, you can, you can, I can make a couple of broad conclusions. Wild species prefer their co-evolved symbiont and, uh, and they don't like the alternative. So Cicer echinospermum, when it's given mesorhizobium symbiont, like Cicer ion, this is biomass accumulation on the horizontal, on the vertical axis. Cicer echinospermum always gains better biomass when it's inoculated with its native symbiont than when it's inoculated on the right-hand side here with its non-native symbiont. Conversely, wild Cicer reticulatum on the right-hand side in blue does much better when it's given its, its native symbiont than when it's given its non-native symbiont. Cultivated doesn't, so you have this change in rank order depending on which microbe, homologous or hetero, heterologous you're associated, inoculated with, but cultivated doesn't change, not much. It doesn't seem to care. And now we've gone back and looked at over a dozen different cultivated genotypes and broadly speaking, the same pattern holds. So we have, uh, uh, again, at a, at a high level, the wilds have narrow interaction. They really prefer the symbiont they get, but they get high, have high performance when they get the right organism. Cultivated has broad interaction, associates with everything in terms of nodule development and, and in terms of biomass scheme, but it has low performance in all instances. So what does that mean? Well, I don't know what it means, but I can suggest one possibility, and that is perhaps there was a trade-off during domestication. But remember that the microbes associated with agricultural systems, the mesorhizobia, are massively diverse. To be a crop, you have to be able to associate that diversity. Otherwise, you're not going to fix nitrogen. Well, maybe there was a trade-off. Maybe you became promiscuous in terms of your association. And the cost of that was increased performance. That's an hypothesis, uh, not uh, anything that we have data to support. But I think it's an interesting possibility. Now, how would you test the agronomic relevance of this diversity? This is complicated and, and requires doing uh, multi-location field trials that are highly replicated. Uh, and that we sort of scratch the surface of here in Ethiopia, but we haven't taken further. In this case, we developed a commercial style inoculum by partnering with a company. And those commercial style inoculums allowed consistency across uh, plant genotype uh, micro uh, interactions. We, we worked with uh, different people in this case in Ethiopia uh, that if we were successful could propagate the information. And we you know sort of set up a small company style set of experiments, but we have not pursued this further. I'm sorry to say, but we, we at least made a, a stab at it. But this is where one would have to go if one wanted to understand the agronomic relevance. So now I'm gonna switch gears uh, completely with the few minutes that I have left. I'm gonna talk about the biogeography, this relationship between geographic space and, and genomic diversity, not of mesorhizobium, but of all the other microbes that are associated with tick root. So when we did the sampling, uh, in those natural sites, not only did we sample mesorhizobium, we sampled microbes and their DNA from all other plant compartments, on the plant, in the plant, in the soil, near the plant, in the soil, away from the plant. We sequenced in, initially using 16S uh, sequencing, 840 different microbial communities, and we came back and sequenced a similar number of whole genomes of the microbes. And if you take that uh, 16S data, you can um, look at, at a at a, an analysis um, called beta diversity, which basically asks whether two samples have similar or different microbial communities. Because the 16S analysis will sample thousands of different taxa in each sample. And without going into the explanation here, let me uh, point you to the red dots here. These are a series of different soil samples away from the plant. And the fact they're near one another says that their composition of the microbes in, in those different soils are very, very similar across the 100,000 square kilometers soil looks like soil. If your soil that had a plant growing in it, you have a slightly different microbial community composition in purple. If you're the root um, uh, growing uh, in, in that soil, in fact, you have a very different set of microbes. If you're on the surface of the root 
light blue, you get another shift in community. If you're inside the root yellow, you get a different shift. There's a huge diversity of microbial communities and they're compartment specific. Soils away from the plant are different from soils near the plant. Soil on the root is different than the soil nearby. Soil microbes inside the root are different from the soil on the surface. And the same thing happens in the leaves and nodules and so on. Microbial diversity is structured by plant compartment across the 100,000 square kilometers. This includes diverse soil types, and it includes all the different plant species. The main effect is plant compartment on uh, microbial diversity. But we were still interested in knowing whether there might be other effects. We couldn't tell them from this sort of natural, the analysis of the natural system. So we went back into the wild and we collected 50 liters, 150 liters of soil from four uh, of the natural wild sites that we knew had diverse soil chemistries and diverse plant genotypes. We took those four different collections of soil, we brought them back to a single greenhouse, also in Turkey, in the Arbakir, Turkey, and we took the soil and we dispersed them into a, a large number of different pots. And from each of those four soil sites, the sites where we collected the soil, we also took their native plant populations. We took three genotypes from each of the four different native plant populations, and we planted them reciprocally into their home and away soils. And again, we went back into those plants when they were mature, and we sampled the microbes in and on the roots, in and on the nodules. And we asked uh, about um, uh, whether soil type had an effect. So I'll show you the data uh, for the microbes within the roots, okay? And this is using a beta diversity known as Jacquard similarity, which looks at whether uh, a microbe is present or absent. Um, and this is taking um, all of the plants from that reciprocal soils experiment in a greenhouse with those four wild soils. And, um, and looking at um, uh, the plant origins, four different uh, plant populations in these colors. And uh, don't worry about what you can see here because you don't see any relationship. Each, each spot represents a microbial community associated with a plant genotype in a, in a soil. And the closer two spots are means their microbial communities are more similar to one another, but there's no pattern at this level. Hmm, Com it's complicated, or maybe there's no signal. But it turns out if you take that data, and this is exactly that same data, and you color it by the soil type, the broad soil type. Remember, there are two basic soil types, basaltic soils that come from these um, uh, volcanic soils where Cicerocanospermum resides, and limestone soils, which are biologically derived soils from where Cicero particulatum comes from. Now you take this reciprocal transplant and with few exceptions, you find strong signal of soil type. Basaltic soils are donating different microbes and are the limestone soils, and it's plant genotype independent. Both Cicero reticulatum and Cicero pinospermum assemble similar communities grown on the basaltic soils, and the same thing on limestone. So strong effect of soil. And indeed, if you, um, now we, but we can take that further because it doesn't rule out the possibility there's a host genotype effect, and we can divide look at the, the soils data now plant genotype by plant genotype so here are the four, four primary plant uh, populations here Ioli, Cassenta, Sericaia, and SD and I take all of the Ioli genotypes on on the four different soils and I find in fact I can see that the plants from the Ioli location when they're transplanted into basaltic soils assemble, assemble a different community than when they're planted into the limestone soils and consistently we see Basaltic, the difference between basaltic and limestone, which is what I just showed you here. But that's not surprising. It just says that what we see at the level of the whole collection, we also see for the individual plant populations on those soils. That's not very surprising. What is surprising or what is interesting is if you take the data, excuse me for jumping around here, and look at the lower, at the right hand side here. This is plant genotype, three different plant genotypes from the population SD. Now that data is separated by basaltic versus limestone soils. And the next slide, I'm gonna color those soils by each of the four different locations. And when I do that, now I see that this single uh, plant genotype of, of example of Cicerocinospermum, grown, uh, that plant genotype grown in the four different soils assembles different microbial communities. It's a strong soil of origin effect. Um, and so purple is that, is Cicero kind of sperm grown on one of the four soils. Uh, salmon is a different soil 
peacock, blue is a different soil, the green uh, is a different soil. They're not perfect separations, but they're, they're substantial. Soil type makes a big difference, but you have to deconvolute it. You have to deconstruct it at the level of individual plant genotypes. And uh, these are the homologous soil interactions in purple for this particular plant genotype. And these are the heterologous away soil interactions. And we see specificity at all levels. And in fact, I just showed you the data for uh, SD over here on the right, but this is the data for the different um, plant populations. We see similar but not identical effects. There's a big effect of soil, but there's also a big effect of plant genotype. So I'm gonna summarize with some simple generalizations. Plants select what they find in the soil. The diversity of those microbes decreases as it goes from the soil into the roots. I haven't shown you that data, but this is a, it turns out it's common in many uh, plant microbiome studies. Beta diversity, the, the composition of the communities is different depending upon the plant compartment. Inside the roots, different than on the root, different than the soil nearby. Leaves are different than roots, nodules are different than, than roots and so on. Differences in soil substrate uh, have an effect, but it's secondary to the effect of the plant compartment. And we conclude that those different soils present different microbial communities from which the plants select. Similarly, there's an effect of plant genetic uh, composition or physiological process. It's probably exerting selection on the microbes, but it's secondary to soil type, which is itself secondary to plant compartment. So we have strong effects of plant genetics, soil type, um, as well as uh, the main effects of plant compartment sort of nested within one another. So this is uh, the natural system and um, bear with me for a minute because I, 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 I wanna get to the most important part but uh, the smallest amount of data. I've told you what's happening in the wild systems with respect to both mesorhizobium and these wild microbial communities but what's happening in the egg cultural system for these complex microbial communities. We went back to our laboratory and just like we sampled plant genetics around the world and microbial genetics for mesorhizobium around the world, we also collected microbial communities and sequenced whole microbial communities from over a thousand different samples globally. And so we can ask, how does microbial diversity change? And the results are striking. I'm just gonna uh, at a, just give you the, the sort of very take home message. These are all the different plant compartments that we, uh, uh, plants that we sequenced on the root. This is all root data in this particular case. What we see, and this is a beta diversity plot on the left-hand side, two spots near one another means their microbial communities are more similar. We see that wild diversity is relatively homogeneous and distinct from the diversity in agricultural systems. Those wild systems have something very different from the agricultural systems. Moreover, if you take the data and you divide it, this, this is all, uh, this isn't roots by the way, this is roots, leaves, this is everything. But if you divide them by the individual plant compartments, now you see a huge effect of geography. Here's the core soil from which, in which the plants were growing. The core soil differs. The soils in Turkey present different microbes than the soils in the US that present different microbes than the soils in Canada that are different from Ethiopia that are different from India. Not surprisingly, therefore, particularly what I've told you a minute ago about the impact of soil, the microbes on the surface of chickpea roots in the US are different than microbes on the surface of chickpea roots in Canada in red, and Turkey in blue, than Ethiopia in, in, in blue, than India in green. And the same thing with the microbes that get into the root. They're different in each of these locations. So the soil is almost certainly the primary determinant here. Um, it's presenting different microbes, different agricultural systems that are all chickpea agricultural systems present very different microbes here in the microbiome, but also uh, in the case of the symbionts, mesorhizobium that I told you about. So did we lose anything? Does this even make a difference that, that things have shifted so much? I don't know the answer to the question. I'll tell you one interesting thing, and that is there's a particular gene function that's specific to the wild systems present in a pseudomonad that's common on all wild roots, but not found in, in cultivated roots uh, uh, in, uh, outside of Turkey. And this pseudomonad carries a well-characterized cluster of genes that produce an antibiotic known as 2,4-diacetylfluoroglucanol. And the importance of that antibiotic is, in fact, this antibiotic is one of the few cases of clear evidence of a function in biocontrol. 
this pseudomonas, um, pseudomonas that carry this gene cluster are very good at killing fungal pathogens of plants. And it raises the possibility that in the wild systems, this is, and this is a function that's unique to those wild systems. And so it raises the possibility that there are functions in those wild systems, not present in agriculture, that might be important, but uh, it's a long road to test these things. So in summary, we have uh, uh, two different trajectories of diversity uh, in, in the plants and the microbes. Plants lost diversity during domestication. The microbes diversified, both in the case of the symbiont, Mesorhizobium, they became more diverse. And in the case of, of, of the microbiome generally, agricultural community composition shot up relative to what happens in the wild systems. But what the diversity, what the significance of that is, at this point, I can't tell you. This has been the, uh, uh, this work is a product of the a PhD for a number of different graduate students and visiting, uh, visiting scientists. The work is funded from a number of different sources, but uh, primarily by the US Agency for International Development, the National Science Foundation and the Australian Brains Research and Development Corporation. And I know I've exactly used my hour and I had, didn't mean to do that, but I'll stop there and answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Really interesting story, but also pretty complicated. I believe there must be a lot of questions. So we have time for a few questions. Yeah, Jim, probably you first. Jim, can you unmute you? If you still have the question. Oh, sorry, Joshin, that was a clap. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah, Cindy. Um, so when you did that um, comparison of your wild type mesorhizobium with your wild type chickpeas, I thought what was missing is the... Um, mesorhizobium that's usually co-inoculated with a domesticated plant. And if you included that, would you see a greater improvement compared to the ones that were collected in the wild? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, and I know the answer, so I'll, I'll tell you briefly. We didn't use um, the sort of traditional inoculants because they're not particularly well characterized. We don't know their provenance other than the fact it comes from BASF or something. And we wanted to use things that we knew of. But what's interesting is that the inoculants that are used commercially are primarily Mesorhizobium cicerae. They're the symbiont, not of the progenitor of the crop, but of the 100,000 year progenitor. And, uh, and that's the one that doesn't do so well with the crop, if you make the comparison. And you know the reason that that organism is used as the source of inoculants, and it was selected decades ago before anybody knew anything about microbial diversity or plant performance, was selected because it's the one that grows more robustly in the laboratory and if you scale it up in fermentation. So the, the symbionts that are that are the symbionts of the immediate progenitor of the crop are more difficult to grow under standard microbial techniques. I'm sure with a little bit of effort one could get them to grow well. They just went with the low-hanging fruit. That is, a, so we did test the species that is the one that's used in agriculture. We just didn't use their strains. I, I just think of the old soybean uh, research that was done where they did a lot of mixing and matching ver you know, different um, strains of soybean with different rhizobia yeah. strains. And, and they did find these difference in optimization depending on, of course, the location, the co-evolved one always did best. But then for me, it looked like they were selecting uh, for the rhizobium that did best on the domesticated soybean then? I don't, the best of my knowledge, uh, at least uh, until recently, there's no knowledge about native versus non-native microbes in soybean. Um, and and, and uh, so I, I think they couldn't have done the experiment, in fact. Um, you know, so here, you know, one could um, look at performance in agricultural systems, which is something we started to head towards. It's a different question than which we were trying to ask here. And that is, what are the consequences of diversity in those wild systems? And uh, so it's a, not, I'm not trying to diminish 
the, in, the importance of your question, but it's not the one we were trying to ask. Great talk. Um, I'm curious to know whether or not you saw uh, the dif whether the differences in your greenhouse experiment might have been due to the colonization efficiency of those different strains or sort of the nitrogen fixing activity. Uh, you know, where, whereabouts did you see the, the difference? Well, it, it breaks down at, at two levels. Um, if you're talking about, uh, and I didn't go into the, the detail about the data, um, if, if you're talking about, um, uh, about Sicer reticulatum, the immediate progenitor of the crop, it actually does pretty well whether it gets its homologous symbiont or heterologous symbiont. In term, so it, it benefits uh, relatively well from the non-native, but it does better with the native, uh, significantly better in terms of statistics. Moreover, if you look at um, nodule development, and we did this uh, in great detail, so we have very, very precise data, there's no difference in development. Uh, so, uh, uh, Sicer reticulatum does exactly the same in terms of development. Whether you look at biomass or numbers of nodules or nodule anatomy, it doesn't make a, a, it doesn't make a difference. What the difference comes in, the benefit derived from those nodules. So associations are fine with reticulatum, irrespective of strain, it's just the outcomes. Now, if you look at a kind of spermum, it's quite different. A kind of spermum associates very effectively with its own symbiont and it's recalcitrant, it does not associate with its non-native organism. And it just doesn't form symbiosis by and large. So we, we look at them as likely having two different mechanisms. One we suspect is involved in specificity and the other one we, we suggest that's involved in, in the function of the nodules once formed. But those are just hypotheses until one would get it at genes and so on. Thanks. Yeah, Khalif, yeah. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, I'm a soil chemist here, and uh, I was, you know, just sort of mulling over some of your soil association uh, data, and uh, it's quite intriguing. Um, and I'm, you know, looking at it in terms of, uh, you know, possible explanations. And I guess one just thought was related to uh, the nature and quality of uh, soil organic matter or whatever the, the, the microbes are basically feeding off of. And uh, looking at, um, um, you know, thinking about it you know, from, uh, from that perspective, you could imagine uh, with different types of mineralogy between, uh, uh, let's say, you know, limestone or, uh, and basalt that perhaps you've got different uh, mineralogies that are responsible for um, governing the, the, the type and nature of, uh, of, of organic matter in the soil. So anyway, just a, a question about that. Well, I mean, it's a great question and, and I don't know the answer to it. I think what we can, what we can say pretty confidently is the different um, plant species are adapted to two different soil types um, and that uh, there are corresponding microbes that are, well, the current different soil types and likely to be adapted. And, and there are different microbes that have that same uh, sort of binary distinction of soil types. There, but there we can't see anything about adaptation, just co-occurrence on soil types and, and plant microbial genotypes. What we can say something about function is in the interaction with the plants and we looked at symbiotic outcomes. There you see, you see evidence of local adaptation, but what factors in the soil? Uh, it's, a, it's an important question, and I, I'm not sure, certain there's more to dig out of our data, by the way, that, that might give some, some, some uh, indication, but I, I think it would really require a separate experiment structure to ask that question specifically. Well, yeah, thanks again. That was a really interesting talk. Any more questions? Hi, I have another question. Um, I was wondering if, given the specificity of soil microbes, uh, you have ambition the creation of site-specific libraries for do, microbes. Do we have site-specific libraries? If, I don't know if they are, but if they are not, have you ambitioned that? And if that could have any value for agronomic fields? I think it's a great idea uh, to do that. And, and our collections 
our DNA is site specific, but doesn't help you very much because you'd like to have the living microbes and the living microbes that, that we have, other than the, the mesorhizobia, by the way, the, I didn't talk about the whole genome data from, uh, from the microbiome, but those are not site specific. And one would need to go back and make those collections. You'd need to get permission from the Turkish government to navigate Nagoya or whatever. Um, and you'd need to, the situation got quite dangerous while we were there, uh, people shooting at each other and being kidnapped. And so we decided uh, not to pursue things further. But I think it, this is the kind of thing that's important, whether it's in this system or in other systems, to try to de deconstruct the diversity in these um, long-standing co-evolved systems and have collections of, of microbes to work with. But we, we did not, we, we have those, but not, at, not site specific. Okay. And um, well, I uh, remember you mentioned that the crops that we are using now are, they don't perform the best um, with this wild um, um, microbes, if you can call it that. What do you think we can do better? What, what are we missing when we are breeding for crops? Well, I like that kind of question because there isn't an absolute answer, and so I can speculate. But you know, my, my guess is, if you think about uh, domestication, and uh, and you, you can think about any trait you want, but think, think about nitrogen fixation because that's the question. You, know, you start off in the wild systems where your source of nitrogen is going to be whatever's in the soil from those natural processes and your ability to fix nitrogen, and probably in those systems, and you have, you know, same thing with with water. You're going to Water availability is going to depend upon the local area and so on. So um, I think you get ecological diversification of plants to, to locations that are suitable for them. But when domestication occurs, they're taken out of what are primarily hilly situations that are not suitable to agriculture mm -hmm. and brought, brought into areas where humans are going to cultivate them. And my guess is that those areas initially are ones where limitations of water availability and, and soil fertility are, are more dependable. Uh, that, that is, you're not limited by them. So fertile river valleys, for example. But imagine that was a first step in domestication. So as soon as that happens, and now you're selecting for other, other things, the domestication traits, shattering upright growth, and so on, um, those things that you start to mitigate with sort of non-intentional inputs, I'm, in my example, this fertile river valley, um, where water and nutrients are, are less of a factor, you start selecting on the other things, you relax selection on the need to be efficient at acquiring water because it's more available. And you relax selection on the need to acquire nutrition from the soil because it's more available. And mm -hmm. this is just a, an hypothesis, but this is exactly what happens with shade avoidance. And what happens is that those traits um, become, uh, where you have relaxed selection, accumulate mutations and become less efficient. And, and you know, eventually you get into a more traditional agricultural systems where inputs are more explicit and selection becomes stronger in the last century. Mm -hmm. and, and so my, my personal hy favorite hypothesis is that it has to do with relaxed selection and uh, selection relaxation on those genes, the pathways degrade uh, without any phenotypic penalty. Um, and it, at least those would be the, the things that are retained. And, and so you become less efficient over time, but, but you know, who knows actually what happened. Okay. You reminded me a comment that I heard or the, we discussed in a class that seems like maybe going back uh, to the ori origins and start over with uh, breeding crops could help us um, come up with better methodologies that integrate uh, a better relation uh, with microbes, plant microbes. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, you know, um... Uh, is an interesting idea and it's a promise uh, that I endorse without knowing that, that it will be uh, successful. There are challenges to be overcome. You know, when, when people selected crops, they, they increased the frequency of valuable alleles, reduced shattering or upright growth. I mentioned a minute ago, two examples. So, you know, one would need to uh, take a combination of approaches. Really what you're talking about doing, I think, is, is creating a new domesticated species that includes the best of cultivated 
and then a diversity of wild because you're not in a position to know what the best of is in the case of wilds. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we've started doing that. Thank you very much. Okay. I think you know you already skipped lunch. <laughs> I would let you go. So with that, please join me in thanking Dr. Cook for the excellent talk. Thank you all for attending today's seminar. Thank you, Jenshin. Mm. Uh, I do have a question maybe I'll ask you. Yeah. So regarding, you, you know, the talk is really interesting regarding the pattern of genetic diversity for the host plants and for the azubia, right? Yeah. So when the dramatic reduction of genetic diversity for the host, on the other hand, for the, you know, the azubia population, you observe the uh, increase of diversity, right? Yeah. Why is that? You, on the other hand, the plants generally show this specificity. Yeah. If you make a comparison, between cultivated uh, chickpea and uh, the wild progenitor, yeah. which one shows higher level of specificity yeah. for the azubia to initiate nodules? Yeah, so here's my explanation. Uh, oh. you know, I, I talked about it as an increase in diversity. Probably that's yeah. a good way to phrase it, because I don't think there was pressure for diversity to increase. Okay. Imagine a situation, and this is, appears to be the case, with mesorhizobium, where globally, there are a large number of different mesorhizobium species, and they're already resident in different locations. And mm -hmm. forget about agriculture. Different locations have different oh, okay. species of mesorhizobium. Agriculture mm -hmm. comes along with chickpea, and you need to fix nitrogen with chickpea, but none of those local strains can do it because they don't have the instructions. They're clearly originated in Turkey. That mm -hmm. integrated conjugate element is, has its origins in Turkey. There's no doubt about it. So what mm -hmm. happens is as the plant comes along and probably carrying some microbes with it initially, some of its native microbes, that integrative conjugative element that carries the instructions moves to the, to the strains that are able to survive under the local conditions, geologically, biologically, and it converts them into chickpea symbionts. And so you acquire the local diversity of the symbiont rather than it, and, and, and the effect is you expand the diversity of the symbiont, by the way, because you put those, that, those genes into new contexts, new genomic contexts. And so rather than being pressure to make diversity get greater, mm -hmm. you simply convert a more diverse set of microbes, probably because the ability to compete, survive locally for the microbe is just as important as the ability to buy a symbi be a symbiont. Because if it wasn't, then what one would have expected is those native symbionts, the native mesorhizobia would now mm -hmm. dominate in other countries, but they don't. So they, they likely can't compete. And for the microbiome, I think it's probably a similar thing. I mean, the effect of soil is so strong. Um, mm -hmm. The microbes in those agricultural systems are the soil microbes. The soil, just soil, not a really related to the plants you mean. Well, they're being selected with remarkable like, Yeah. But mm -hmm. that, that game of selection, mm -hmm. I don't mean genetic selection, I mean, uh, uh, oh, yeah. That okay. game plays itself out in a similar way, mm -hmm. in a different location around the world, similar in the sense that you have selectivity, and that selectivity is reproducible within mm -hmm. the location, but exactly what gets selected is different between the different locations. So soils present, and the plant uh, selects from that, which is, what else could it do? Yeah, that's a really cool story. <laughs> I needed to read your papers more carefully. <laughs> well, that part's not published yet, but uh, but hopefully it will be. That's one of my. Oh, this part not published yet. The mic microbiome stuff. No, we've got several stuff things written up, and I've been. So, I haven't had a chance, but but that's to get done. And I, yeah, ready to wrap up for publication. You mean, ready. Me, yeah. My uh -huh. career, you mean? Or you mean? I mean, I mean the timeline for your publication. Well, the goal is there are several papers uh, I see. that relate to this, and the goal is to get them out this spring. But we'll see how many I can write. Uh, I, I'm there thinking are, there are advanced drafts of some of them. Yeah, that that sounds like a very big paper. Yeah. On this work. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> you know what? Let's see where it gets published. Then you can congratulate me. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay, take yeah. care. Thanks for inviting. Yeah, yeah take care. Yeah.
拜拜。